Welcome to Author Master. I'm incredibly excited to, to share with you a, a powerful book. Uh, one of my favorite books is on my shelf that I use as a resource. I love it. You can fix your brain. I'm with Dr. Tom O'Brien, and I'm going to provide a little bit of background before we go into the book. And I'm sure you'll find this incredibly insightful. So let me start with, and I'm going to cut in there um, the introduction, and now I'm going to go. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Tom. Look, I, as I said right at the beginning, I, I've got this book here, You Can Fix Your Brain. Just one hour a week for the best memory product of your sleep you have ever had. Let's just start by, and I know you in other books, you've, we spoke about the auto immune fix and, and you, you know, you've led summits and, and you've got this incredible um, you know, platform that you've operated from. But I'd love to start with um, You Can Fix Your Brain because it's, for me, um, it's so relevant to my practice. Uh, but I'd love for you to just share with everybody as a starting point, what began the process of not with purely, um, you know, you can fix your brain, but writing books, producing summits, um, bringing education out into the community and expanding the scope of your practice. I'd love to get some insight into how you move um, from clinical practice into a virtual, into a, um, you know, even a book-based um, yeah, expression of your skill sets. I, um... I've always been about service, uh, uh, helping my fellow man in whatever way I can. And uh, my chiropractic profession was about that and, and uh, seeing patients. And I, I found that my, my strength, my real strength, uh, whether I liked it or not, but where I excelled was being a catalyst, a catalyst for change. And I just love to talk about things that startle people. You know, I mean, we, we just um, had a baby uh, two weeks ago, uh, my second marriage. Well, thank you, thank you. And uh, I just learned a few days ago that human breast milk has over 200 oligosaccharides in it. Oligosaccharides are prebiotics that feed the bacteria in the gut. And some of these oligosaccharides, um, um, they, they have the glycan structure um, that, of, of the lining of the intestines. And so this milk has some of the structure of the lining of the intestines that pathogenic bacteria really like and grab onto. So these oligosaccharides act as decoys. So pathogenic bacteria grabs onto the oligosaccharide and it then gets escorted out in a stool that it can't bind onto the inner lining of the baby's gut. And hundreds of mi uh, millions of years of development for humans on, on the planet, how did we devise a, a food for newborns and for infants when they, they can't feed themselves, how comprehensive this food is. And I find that kind of information so empowering. Uh, and I've sent messages to a number of my pediatrician friends uh, with the study saying, of course it's critical for breastfeeding. You know, because, so I, I just love being a catalyst. I'm always wanting to carry information out so others can benefit from the things that I'm exposed to. I guess I'd say it like that. And it took me 30 years to write my first book. <laughs> it, it took, um, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I, I have to be called to write a book, meaning I, I have to feel a calling inside of me to do it. I've wanted to do it for a long, long time. And I take notes every once in a while for years, but I, I, I couldn't get it. And finally one day it was, okay, it's time. This is such an important topic, autoimmune disease and the world of predictive autoimmunity, identifying the autoimmune spectrum before so much tissue gets killed off that you not, now you've got the disease. And that was such an important concept and part of my practice that I wanted to carry that message out to the world. And I wrote the autoimmune fix. And uh, 
which won a national book award, which I don't know any health books that win national book awards. I mean, it was great. It was really great. And, uh, uh, but it took me two years, over two years before I was ready to write another one. And uh, I decided to take the brain with the same predictive autoimmunity concept. How do you identify the early stages of this end stage that we're all terrified of? You know, everybody knows someone who had a heart attack and changed their diet, started exercising, and they look better than they've looked in years. Most of us know someone diagnosed with cancer that went through the protocols and it's in remission and they feel really good. No one knows anyone with a brain deterioration disease who's doing good. No one. And it terrifies us, so we don't talk about it. So that's my world. When I realize nobody talks about this, I'm writing that book. Uh, and, and it's for me, there has to be a passion to do it. And, and you said right at the beginning, it is about service, adding value, catalyzing you know, positive and beneficial change. And I'd love, I mean, when we're in clinical practice, the ability to, to impact our patients, their lives, we, we get incredible you know, joy out of that. And the benefits to them are also you know, in our own hearts and minds as well. So if service is an essential element of, of, of your drive, of your motivation, motivation, writing these books, the autoimmune books, the, um, you know, that you can fix your brain. These books then allow you to extend that service and impact because you're no longer um, located purely for the practice and, and also then delivering summits around that process. So what, what type of internal experience did you have now that you've written these books and they're out there in the community to become award-winning books, they're bestsellers, they're, their reach is, you know, so far. Um, out there beyond what you could do in a clinical practice. What has this meant to you individually, um, personally, that sense of service, uh, you know, the fulfillment that comes from that? Really a, a sense of fulfillment. Uh, uh, you know, I put on 150,000 miles a year. I fly uh, and lecture all over the world. Been to Australia a couple of times, really like Australia. Um, and, um, uh, I'm always stopped. I don't, it's rare that on a trip, I'm not stopped um, walking through the airport or, or you know, it's kind of like, I'm walking through the airport one day, I saw Orville Redenbacher, Orville, uh, the popcorn guy. Mm. And he's walking the other way. I said, Orville, and he says, I said, love your popcorn. He said, thank you, thank you. Just kept walking. I thought, how oh, great, <laughs> really great. But I'm, I'm always stopped and people say, you're Dr. Tom. And I said, yes. They often start crying. You know, and they say, uh, you saved my daughter's life. And I said, oh, tell me about it. Well, <laughs> and I've learned that if I give them two minutes, just two minutes of my time, and I say, oh, that's great. Oh, thank you so much. You made my day. I, I've got to catch a flight, but thank you so much. And they've been like validated. Uh, and it gives me a warmth in my heart and just makes me want to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, and, and you know, all the canceled flights and missed flights and all the hassles of no good food in an airport. No, you know, who cares? I mean, that's, that's just uh, the price of admission, if I can say it like that. You know, it's the price of admission to do the work. You know, who cares? That's beautiful. In the book, um, you know, you can fix your brain. I, the, you know, in chiropractic, we talk about the, the three T's. In fact, in recent terms, it's been the four T's, you know, trauma, toxins, thoughts, and technology. You talk about the pyramid of health, you know, electromagnetic mindset, biochemistry and structure. I'd love uh, for you, your thoughts about the, the chiropractic influence, uh, the, the role of that within that pyramid of health within a person's lives and impact it would have. So I'd love for you to talk about this framework within your book and what it means, um, what, its origin within your writing and its impact within people's lives. Well, you know, um... One of my mentors was Dr. George Goodhart, the founder of Applied Kinesiology. And, and uh, back in the days, um, 
in the 70s and 80s, uh, George would talk about the triangle of health, structure, emotional, spiritual, and chemical. And uh, a couple of years before he died, I had dinner with Dr. Goodhart and I said, Dr. Goodhart, I don't think it's a triangle. And he looked at me and said, well, what do you think, Tom? I said, I think it's a pyramid. Well, a pyramid has three sides. I said, no, sir, it doesn't, it has four. And he had this little smile to see if he could trip me up or not. Because there's a base, right? And the base is the home of chiropractic. It's the structure, it's the home of chiropractic, massage, uh, orthopedic pillows. Where's your car seat? Um, is it angled backwards? Are you driving like this? So that if I were to stand up, my head's waiting for, I've lost my lordosis. Uh, so the base of the pyramid is structure. And I've seen so many miracles over the years uh, uh, addressing structure. There was, a, there was an article that came out by Browning in the journal Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics. I think it was in 1988, I'm not sure of the date, but it was pelvic pain and organic dysfunction in a patient without low back pain. That was the title. And it's a game-changing article. Every student should read this article, uh, every doc. I had five copies of this article, clean copies. I put them in um, uh, clear acetate folders. They were in every treatment room. Uh, they were in the exam room and the treatment rooms because I would reference to patients about chiropractic and about how it can affect anything, just absolutely anything. This was the story of a 39-year-old woman fell down a flight of stairs at 18 and um, thought she was a little banged up, but she was okay. But shortly after that, she started developing abdominal pain and they thought it was her appendix and uh, blood tests were normal, but she kept having this pain. So they did um, surgery. They took out her appendix. The appendix was normal. And the story keeps going. She started having bladder problems and uh, 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 reproductive system problems. Uh, they took out her left ovary. They took out her right ovary. Uh, uh, they did five bladder surgeries. Uh, three exploratory bowel surgeries, um, 13 surgeries for this woman over 20 years, 13 surgeries. They never found the problem. And by this time, she's in Depends in diapers because she has no urethral control. She can't feel when she's defecating. Um, uh, her whole pelvic basin was uh, completely dysfunctional. And a friend said, why don't you see my chiropractor? He helped me when I had a bladder infection. I mean, maybe, you know, why not? So she went to this guy and he, and all he did was flexion distraction. Uh, I had an old McManus table, but Cox's tables, a flexion distraction and a lumbar belt and some Kegels. And in two weeks, she started feeling better. And then there's the graph of all of the symptoms she had. The next column is D for the duration in years. And the next column is N for normalization in how many weeks. And pain of 15 years gone in six weeks. Pain of nine years and all the way down the list, gone, gone, gone. To the last one was deficient precoital lubrication. She was unable to lubricate to have relations with her husband. That was normal in 10 weeks. Just by doing flexion distraction, a lumbar belt, and some Kegels. Now, so that opened up my whole world in the 80s to what was possible with chiropractic. And I knew the philosophy. You know, I graduated in, in 1980, and I, you know, I, I did the talk, uh, but it was on a belief system. And when I saw that study, that really helped me to get it in my bones. Everyone needs a chiropractor. Everyone needs to have evaluation for structural imbalances because it's the base of the pyramid of health. So in, in my book, um, You Can Fix Your Brain, I talk about the pyramid and the biochemistry, the emotional or spiritual and the electromagnetic. So uh, that's my... Uh, 
uh, categorization for it, the pyramid. It is, and it's a great platform that every chiropractor has within their training and forms a great platform for your book and for your, for your patient education and your community education. Um, you also talk in the book about uh, biomarkers for brain health um, and, and the importance of, you know, don't guess but test. And I think this is an important distinction for chiropractors as well. I love that, you know, chiropractors know they need to do their ortho, their neuro testing, their chiropractic testing, but there's more that you can do to get feedback of where the patient is at, what changes they need to make and the direction that you can give them. And then to get further feedback on what impact those changes have made to reinforce the decisions that the patient is making for their health and well-being, and demonstrating positive and beneficial change. So I think, you know, you talk about this in the book in, in depth and what I love about your book, you know, just before I get you to answer that question, I just really want to highlight, there are so many distinctions in writing books. Oftentimes people write an educational book and it's, it's a good read and you can read and say, oh, good, that's information that I can use. And I'm grateful for that. It was a light, easy read. Yours, that thick, filled with content, is, is a tone of both research, of education, of information and implementation, but something you can study. I have it there and I read it on an ongoing basis. So the part, particularly that part about learning on the biomarkers, um, I'd love for you to talk to the practitioners about how you bring, move from a clinical book of education of what a patient should do to realizing there is more to the process of assessment and the benefit that has to the patient. Right, right. You know, you don't have to be a board certified nutritionist to do this work. Um, if it's not your passion to do nutritional stuff, then don't do it. Don't do it. But team up, you know, find uh, uh, a practitioner in your area. Say, look, you know, I'd like to refer my nutritional patients over to you. Uh, you know, and I, of course, like in any situation, I don't want to lose the patient for structural care and all that. But so I'm willing to give this a try. Uh, we tend to be hoarders as chiropractors. You know, we, we hoard the patient. Medicine doesn't do that. Cardiologists never worry about orthopedics, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, a different way of thinking about things. So you don't have to know how to do all this stuff. But if you're interested in helping a patient to figure out where they're at, if you've got that kind of Sherlock Holmes investigative quality to you, um, the, the Zoomer test, because you zoom in on the problem, Zoomer tests from Vibrant Labs um, are just remarkable. Their, their sensitivity and specificity is 97 to 100%. And you can identify food sensitivities. There's a wheat Zoomer, a corn Zoomer, a lectin Zoomer, a dairy Zoomer. Um, uh, all of, uh, there's a number more, gut Zoomer, uh, mold and fungus zoomer so that you can identify is the patient's immune system because I tell patients your immune system is the armed forces in your body it's there to protect you and there's an army an air force a marines a coast guard a navy we call them IGA IgG IgE IgM if your child seems to be having some kind of allergic reaction and you take him to an allergist and he does pinprick tests on his back and the pinprick tests come back and say, he's sensitive to tomatoes, but none of the other foods. And that's, and that's his recommendation, stop eating tomatoes. You've got a guy who is operating from an archaic point of view. That's what they did in the 1950s when the renegade medics who were outside thinkers came up with this concept of let's poke the skin with some food and see if there's a reaction here. And right, um, pinprick test came out in the 1950s and we know it tests IgE. That's the Air Force. And if the Air Force is activated, you got a problem with whatever's activating IgE. But does that mean you don't have a problem with the food because there's no Air Force being called out? No, of course not. What about the Marines, IgA? Well, we know the diagnosis of celiac is based on IgA antibodies, not IgE and IgG antibodies and IgM antibodies. Uh, with, with Alzheimer's, there's 246 studies on herpes simplex one. 
and uh, Alzheimer's. Just Google it. You'll see. You'll find them. They're, they're, they're right there. And what, when, they, when a patient unfortunately passes of Alzheimer's, and if they autopsy, biopsy the beta amyloid plaque in the brain, it's often loaded with IgM antibodies to herpes, simplex one, loaded with them. So you want to check IgM antibodies. Uh, that's why uh, Vibrant looks at IgA, IgG, IgM, IgE. It's a much more comprehensive overview. So if you're someone that wants to look with eyes that see, you know, and help your patients deal with this, um, uh, you certainly can develop that skill. And you don't have to be the one to treat all of that. I think most people, if they have the interest, they would. But if you don't really want to get into that because you're so busy with sports injuries and that's, that's really your, your shtick and you love it, and you're the best sports, sports injury guy in town, that you're the guy I want to see, right? But in conversation, because you've been reading this stuff because your wife's father died of Alzheimer's or something, and you've been reading about this, and you know, you know, this test seems to give us a lot of information about the brain being on fire years before uh, uh, people develop Alzheimer's, decades actually, two decades. Um, and you know, we, we can certainly do this test here. It's a simple blood test. Uh, and uh, see what you got. So you, you can follow your interests without having to have to be uh, an expert in the outcome. As long as you have someone to refer them to, you, you don't leave them hanging. Okay. And obviously, you know, reading books such as, such as Lisa Pizza Brain gives you that platform to develop that knowledge and that expertise. Um, just as we bring this to conclusion, I, I have another question I think that I'd love for you to speak to the practitioners about uh, in the sense, sense of your impact, as we've spoken about, has expanded massively because you're in a broader community outside of the scope of clinical practice. Uh, and, and, you know, you have summits and you have books. Um, what would you say to the practitioners who want to have greater outreach and have greater impact? And they may feel like, well, you know, it took Dr. Tom 30 years to write a book and He's obviously an incredible speaker and an articulate person, well-researched. It's, it's perhaps, a, you know, it may take me 50 years and there's no way I can do that. But in reality, we all have that ability to you know, expand past our own limitations, transcend um, those limiting beliefs and, and have a greater impact. So to those practitioners that maybe want to develop some, some greater impact, go online, write a book, um, expand their presence and have a, have a greater role in the health and lives of the community, not only their practice. How would you, you know, recommend they begin that journey, expand their potential and, and, and outreach more effectively? If you're in practice um, full time, uh, there's, there's a couple of exercises that I recommend. I used to go back to national and I give talks. I did it to every class uh, for 15 years, I think or so. Uh, the first trimester, how to do school successfully and the eighth trimester, how to open a practice successfully. And there's just a couple of things that we're not taught. We're, we're, we're just not taught. So the uh, first one, go in the bathroom, well, pick the topic that you're gonna talk about. I'll use the example of leaky gut, uh, but it could be enhanced cervical range of motion. It doesn't matter what the topic is, but pick the topic and on a three by five card, just write down the bullet points that you wanna make sure that you tell a patient when you're talking about a leaky gut. Mrs. Patient, your intestines, your whole digestive tract is a tube. It starts at the mouth, goes to the other end, kind of winds around in the center there, you know, it's about 20, 25 feet long. The inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. And when you eat food, if you think of that tube like a donut, if you stretch a donut out and you look down the center of the donut, that's your digestive tract. It's one big long tube. When you swallow food, it's not in your body, it's in the tube. And it's gotta go through the walls of the tube to get into the bloodstream. How does that happen? You swallow, you, you chew a bite of a steak and you chew it four or five times, you should chew it 20, but you don't, you don't chew, most people don't chew enough. You chew it four or five times, you swallow it down. How does that clump of meat 
become the amino acids that your muscles use to make new muscle. How does that happen? Your enzyme, if you think of your digestive system um, like scissors, the, and the proteins are like a pearl necklace, when you chew and swallow, your digestive enzymes start cutting the protein into smaller clumps of the pearl necklace. Snip, 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 snip. And eventually it gets down to each pearl, the pearl necklace that can go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. The bigger clumps can't get through. When you have a tear in the cheesecloth, larger clumps of the food that's being snipped down, it's just not done yet, but larger clumps can get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. That's a leaky gut. And those larger clumps are called macromolecules, big molecules. Now your immune system has to fight that stuff in your bloodstream because that's not something I can use to make new muscle cells. It's a clump of something. And now you make antibodies to beef or to chicken or to tomatoes or to bananas. And that's the person that does a, 20, a 90 food blood panel to see what they're sensitive to, comes back they're sensitive to 15, 20 different foods. Oh my God, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is. Your immune system's trying to protect you. When you heal the leaky gut, wait three months, heal the leaky gut, go back and check, now you're sensitive to two foods. Those are the ones you stay away from. But Mrs. Patient, your digestive system is one big long tube, starts the mouth, goes to the other end, kind of winds around in the center there, it's about 20, 25 feet long. The inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. And you have to be able to do that wrap again and again and again and again with just as much focus on Monday morning as late Friday afternoon. So you have to get outside of your head and how you feel. Oh man, I had too many beers last night. Your patients don't care. They're here for you, right? Oh, you know, I got menstrual problems. They don't care. They don't care. You have to be able to do your rap. We call it the elevator speeches. And everybody's got elevator speeches that they're talking to patients again and again and again. And when you do the three by five cards for the bullet points, then you go in the bathroom and close the door. And you look in the mirror. Mrs. Patient, your digestive system is a tube. It starts at the mouth. Oh, my hair. Oh, my God, my hair. I got to fix my hair. Mrs. Patient, your digestive system is a tube. It starts at the mouth and goes to the other end, kind of winds around. Oh, my God, this blush. Oh, I'm blushing here. Why am I? My makeup's not very good. Yabba, 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 yabba. You have to be able to go in the mirror and do the rap, the elevator speech again and again and again with compassion and, you know, and with purpose. You have to stop the yabba, yabba, yabba in your mind so that you can deliver the message to your piggy. You want to deliver a message out in the world? You deliver the message to the patient in front of you first. And so you've got to get that down so the person on Monday morning gets the same message, comprehensive. And you'll change your message as you learn more information. But the point is you can't ad lib it spur of the moment and expect to be comprehensive doesn't happen that way. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. The second thing, we call it the credit card. Every time you hand your credit card to somebody to pay for something, you're in the supermarket line, right? And you're waiting and then it's your turn, you're unloading your stuff, she says, hello, welcome to Jewel. And oh, thank you. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. No, 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 no. How are you? And they look up. Oh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Oh, good, good. You know, the sun's out, it's a beautiful day. Uh, uh, will you get off while, uh, before nighttime? Oh yeah, I get off before. Oh, great, hopefully the sun's still out then. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And you give me a card and all that. I guarantee you every time as you're leaving, they go, bye, bye. They give you a little love because you were interested, not interesting. You don't want to be interesting with your patients. You want to be interested. And the only way that happens is by training. Because people, we tend to be defensive. You know, we, we socially distance before this current pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so you want, you look them in the eye 
And you say, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? No, 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 really. And they look mm -hmm. up from it. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. Oh, good, good, glad to hear it. And then I always use the sun or something. You know, oh, it's a warm night out. Oh, it's raining now. Hopefully it'll stop raining before you get off. Oh yeah, I hope so. Okay, bye. Bye. They always do that, always. And it's, it's and, just, that connection that we make is so important. And, you know, um, and I, the, the thing I wanted, wanted to comment just before we, we come to a conclusion here as well is what's really interesting is when you spoke about that, but the training in those elements, the same message at the beginning of the week, at the end of the week, that's the message that ends up going out in the community. And you take the knowledge you have, which we all have, refine the communication process, and then we have the opportunity to place it as an expanded message on any platform we choose, whether it be a book, whether it be a podcast, whether it be a summit, um, whether you put a docu series together. I love the fact that you know you're, you're creating a platform for people to take their own existing knowledge and realize it be expanded out there into the community. Um, we have run out of time, Dr. Tom. So is there any final message you have um, for this audience before we uh, wrap up? There's one more point I'd like to give, if I may. And I don't have my phone here, but if I did, if this were my cell phone. Hi, it's Dr. Tom. And I just want to talk for a moment about why orthopedic pillows are so important to sleep with. And, you know, there's, we're supposed to have this curve in our neck. There are four curves in the body from a side view. We're supposed to have four curves. Most of us are heads in front of the shoulders. And you really want to start working to... You do a one minute video on orthopedic pillows. You do a one minute video on the value of orthotics. You do a one minute video on an exercise that you frequently give. And your front desk has those. And when you write your slip and they're going out to the front desk, oh, hi, Kathy, I see the doctor wants you to have the video on orthopedic pillows. Okay, what's your email again? Okay, it's in your inbox by the time you get home. And you start practicing talking to a camera. And you'll see that you make mistakes, you know, and you don't have to get fancy equipment. Just use an iPhone. The cameras are great now. And you just do as the more of these you do with an iPhone that you're using with your patients and your front desk is distributing or you're sending out to your email list, start building a list of every just accumulate the list. The more you send out information like that, the more you get known in your community. Brilliant. Dr. Tom, great advice, great strategies. You've done so, so much in, in your career. And I know that people are going to benefit great from, again, hearing your message here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, your time, your message. Thank you. Thank you.